Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. Um, today's my birthday and I'm 41 years old. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Somebody in the office laughed. That was not very nice. Actually, 61 years old today. And there's nothing I'd rather do than bring you the news on my birthday. So a couple of announcements, one that you have heard a couple times, which is conference is only a few weeks away. My gosh, do we have an all-star lineup? These people, you will not have another opportunity to hear them speak in North America this year, let alone all at the same conference. So get your bodies here. We still have a few openings left, and we'd love to see you here for an amazing weekend of food and experts. And go to our website at wellnessfarmhealth.com, and you'll see the What's New section. You can click on conference, and you can see the conference flyer and descriptions of the speakers and that sort of thing. Or send me an email, and I'll send you information. I mean just remarkable what we're going to be doing here in just a few weeks. And our, our headliners are people like Peter Gercha, who is the co-founder of Cochrane Collaboration in Denmark, coming all the way here from Copenhagen. So anyway, be here. And the other thing, I'm really excited about this, water filters. We have had intermittently over the 21 years we've been in business, um, water filters. And um, the problem is getting water filters that meet my criteria that come from a reputable manufacturer. And we finally have that. Uh, we, we do have water filters now. They come in countertops, under sinks, showers, whole house. They take out lead. We have them for well water. We, they take out heavy metals and drugs and all kinds of things. So anyway, if you are interested in a water filter, I've had one in my house for years and years. I had a lot of personal motivation to find another supplier because I wanted to have a new filter in my house. So finally, thanks to Julie Gardner, who's a colleague of mine who works here at Wellness Farm Health. She's the person who tracked all this stuff down and made the arrangements. Water filters are available through Wellness Farm Health. All right, today we're gonna to talk about a topic that a lot of people are interested in for good reason, because the incidence is really high and that's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The liver is the largest internal organ in the body and is responsible for many functions which include making proteins and blood clotting factors, producing and regulating cholesterol and triglyceride levels, and making bile which assists with digestion. The liver breaks down and helps to eliminate toxins like urea and acts as a storage unit for glycogen, vitamins, and many other substances. It really is the workhorse of the body. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease refers to a collection of several liver conditions developed by people who drink little to no alcohol, and it's defined as fat storage in the cells of the liver that exceeds 5% of the weight of the liver without the presence of hepatitis B or C. Today, it's the most common form of chronic liver disease, and it's estimated to affect, get this, between 20% and 30% of adults in westernized countries. When we get into the risk factors for it, I think you'll understand why the incidence in these areas is so high. Incidence is higher in males, increases with age, and this will not surprise you, the main cause is diet and lifestyle habits. NAFLD, as we'll call it from now on, can progress to non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis, or NASH. It's estimated that between 2 and 3% of the population has NASH, which can progress, if left alone, to liver cirrhosis and actually liver cancer. Risk factors include obesity, particularly visceral adiposity, insulin resistance, high plasma triglyceride levels, polycystic ovary syndrome, hypothyroidism, hypopituitarism, and metabolic syndrome. Prevalence is as high in, as 80% in obese adults, between 20, 30 and 50% in diabetics, and as high as 90% in people who have high plasma cholesterol levels. So, these are all conditions related to diet and lifestyle habits, which then increase the risk of developing still another condition, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Even children, and this is really sad, can develop NAFLD with incidence among children at 3 to 10% right now, increasing to as high as 40 to 70% in obese children in a dose-dependent manner. The heavier they are, the more likely they are to develop it. Children can also develop cirrhosis as a result of NAFLD without ever taking a single drink of alcohol. Patients with NAFLD can be asymptomatic for long periods of time. When symptoms do develop, they include things like enlarged liver, fatigue, and pain in the upper right abdomen. Symptoms of NASH and cirrhosis include abdominal swelling, uh, enlarged blood vessels, enlarged spleen, red palms, and jaundice. 
Complications of NAFLD include cirrhosis or scarring of the liver, and untreated cirrhosis can lead to fluid accumulation in the abdomen, mental confusion, liver cancer, and liver failure. NAFLD patients have an eight times higher risk of cardiovascular events and also a higher risk of cancer. Many asymptomatic patients get diagnosed quite by accident when routine blood tests show elevated liver enzymes like ALT and GGT, and after elimination of potential causes such as high alcohol intake and hepatitis, it becomes the default diagnosis. So let's look at risk factors, and I don't think these will surprise you because they're the risk factors for all the predisposing conditions. Higher intake of fat, oil, meat, and dairy are associated with higher liver enzymes, and fat intake, particularly saturated fat, significantly increases the, the risk of both NAFLD and NASH. Higher saturated fat, also in, uh, fat intake also increases both insulin resistance and plasma triglyceride levels, and then these in turn are risk factors for NAFLD. Research shows that patients with NASH consume an average of 14% of calories from saturated fat. I can tell you from looking at food journals for members here that a lot of them come in here consuming significantly higher than 14% of calories from saturated fat. So, um, and, and again, in a dose-dependent manner, this increases the risk. Protein, specifically animal protein, is a risk factor for fatty liver disease. A study including 3,440 people showed that participants eating the most protein were 37% more likely to have fatty liver disease compared to those who ate the least, but those who ate the most animal protein, it was a 50% increased risk. So when analyzing all of the data, the researchers concluded that after controlling for all kinds of other factors, it really was animal protein, not vegetable protein, that, that created the risk. While by def definition, NAFLD occurs in people who do not consume excess amounts of alcohol, some studies suggest that consuming 40 grams of alcohol a day, this would be like um, three beers, four ounces of distil distilled alcoholic vodka or whiskey or 16 ounces of wine, can double the risk of fatty liver with women having a higher risk at intakes of only 20 to 30 grams per day. So I put out, um, I filmed a video clip last week on um, the dangers of alcohol and how the alcohol industry has essentially hid, hidden the risks of alcohol, particularly as it pertains to cancer risk for many years. But I still see people that drank the, the Kool-Aid and think that red wine every night with dinner is somehow protective, so you need to get rid of that thought. Fructose occurs naturally in fruit and some vegetables, and it used to be pretty limited in the diet, but the main source of fructose in today's diet is high fructose corn syrup, which contains 55% fructose, and it's an ingredient in things like sugar-sweetened beverages and a lot of refined and processed foods. Now, some experts claim that consuming soft drinks containing high fructose corn syrup by itself is a risk factor for developing NAFLD. However, a meta-analysis of all available human trials concluded that fructose alone and high fructose corn syrup alone do not increase the risk. Instead, excess consumption of calories regardless of the source, which leads to obesity and type 2 diabetes, the predisposing factors, is the cause. The researchers reported that fructose and high fructose corn syrup behave no differently than glucose or refined starches and only becomes harmful when consumption contributes to excess calorie intake. And this brings me to the place of reminding everybody, which I do from time to time, that the key to good nutrition is not nutritional villains and heroes, like one food's going to solve all your problems or one bad ingredient makes for all of the, uh, the bad things that happen in health, but rather looking at the totality of the diet uh, to determine your health outcomes. So I'm not a fan of high fructose corn syrup, but I've often said if you took all of it out of all of the foods on the market today and changed nothing else, you wouldn't see a change in health status because people would still continue to eat the same nutrient empty, calorie dense garbage canned foods and too much fat. It really wouldn't make a difference. Um, in terms of treatment, weight loss while eating a low-fat, high-fiber, plant-based diet can be an effective treatment for NAFLD. Now, we don't have clinical trials that have specifically evaluated the use of a diet like the one we use here for treatment of NAFLD, but studies have shown that such diets are effective for addressing conditions that are risk factors like type 2 diabetes, obesity, high triglycerides, and insulin resistance. Plant-based diets are also low in protein, particularly animal protein, which been, has been identified as a risk factor. 
Just for a few examples, in one study, intensive lifestyle education, improved diet, and loss of 7% or more of body weight resulted in significant improvements in inflammation and ballooning injury for patients with NASH. In another study, obese patients with fatty liver were assigned to either a restricted calorie diet and exercise consisting of walking or jogging, or a control group for three months. Patients in the intervention group showed lower levels of liver enzymes, cholesterol, fasting glucose, and decreased steatosis, while there were no changes in the control group. And yet one more, a lower fat, cal lower calorie diet reduced both body weight and intrahepatic fat levels, and lowered insulin resistance in patients with NAFLD. The bottom line is that this condition is just another one brought on by eating a diet high in animal foods, fat, and calories. It often accompanies diseases that result from such a diet, like type 2 diabetes. It's easy to prevent, and its early eight stages, it's easy to treat by eating a low-fat, plant-based diet comprised of whole foods. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.